Good morning, Fancy Meat Computers. Um. <laughs> it seems someone in the chat has started a nasty rumor that it's my birthday today. It's not my birthday today. <laughs> Yesterday was my wife's birthday, but it's not my birthday. <laughs> but thank you for all the thank you for all the good birthday wishes. I'll pass them on to my. Wife. The whole chat is is saying happy birthday to me, so I'm passing it to you. Aw, thank you, chat. Allie says thank you. <laughs> <laughs> mm. oh my god <clears throat> oh my god all right <laughs> yeah we'll see we'll see this might be one of those things that like as people filter in over the next 15 minutes into the lecture, we'll see how many of them catch the fact that it's not actually my birthday, <laughs> but they're still like saying happy birthday. <laughs> um, yes, epic troll, epic troll. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> how are y'all doing? Hope you're all doing okay. It's, uh, November. Congratulations. Today is the 9th of November. Remembrance Day is on Thursday this week. So, uh, minute of silence, everyone. Very solemn. Um, yeah. Just wish us a happy day to be safe. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, my, my birthday's in February, actually. It's like two days off of, uh, two days off of Valentine's Day. Two days before Valentine's Day, actually. And then our wedding anniversary is two days after Valentine's Day. So it's like, it's a big week for, like, celebrations and stuff. Hmm. All right. Ah! There we go, another, uh, another person with a birthday. Um, happy birthday to your brother. Happy, happy birthday from all of us to you. Happy, happy birthday. Da, 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 da. Anyway, so. <clears throat> um, announcements, let's see. Um, <laughs> so, Mark has done a, um, test one solution guide. So for all of you who are hoping to see what you did wrong with the test, um, he's posted a video. And uh, that should answer some of your questions. Also, for assignment six, there was a hint for question one. See? So uh, there you go. Ta-da. And uh, then that's it. That's it, really. Bomp. Oop. Bomp. There we go. Ah, Gregory's birthday is today. Okay. Everybody say happy birthday to Greg. Happy birthday, Greg. Hmm. Ah, so the uh, the GPA that you need to maintain to stay in the computer science program is uh, that same rules as engineering. <clears throat> That's cool. Um... There we go. Some appropriately apportioned, uh, some appropriately apportioned per happy birthday wishes. wishes. <laughs> there we go. All right. <clears throat> you know, it's kind of funny. Like with a class this big, probably we have at least, at least three birthdays in the class a week. You know. <laughs> Wait, is that the same Gregory? It is the same Gregory, okay. We didn't have, like, two Gregories in the class, and, like, one Gregory is, like, claiming the birthday of good wishes from the one whose birthday it actually is. 
that would be an awkward situation. Um, boop. All right. What's a four GPA in actual grades? Like, um, according to McMaster's system, it's like, um, like the that you'll get on the final report card. It's like D minus is one, D is two, D plus is three, C minus is four. So you need to C minus to stay in the program. Then it's like five, six, you know, C, C plus, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the scale where an A plus is 12. And I believe an A plus is anything north of 88%, I think. I could be wrong. But it, it's it basically, if you just take the standard letter grades that have existed since like the the Victorians invented them, and then you um, you know sort of map that onto numbers, that's your number scale. I guess it's because it's easier to take an average of a number than it is to take the average of a letter. But uh, <laughs> yeah, why does McMaster use this weird twelve point system? I don't know. I just work here. Oh, A plus is 90s? Oh, yeah, okay. Letter grades are such a broken system. Just give it a sub percentage. Oh, I bet you think we should move to the metric system as well. Pah. Friggin' globalist imperialists with their friggin' measurement systems that they're imposing on us. Jeez. Anyway. Um... <laughs> So, we should actually talk about lecture stuff, eh? Um, <clears throat> so, when last we spoke, we were, spot we were speaking on the subject of objects, classes and objects. Just to recap this idea for you guys very quickly. <clears throat> also, I believe we should all use Go. What's your point? Yes, um, Mark is a Go imperialist. Uh, he will not be satisfied until Go has conquered all of the other programming languages. Uh, but to be fair, it does look like a pretty good language. He was showing it to me a little bit last week, and uh, yeah. It's like C, but better, and I love C. So there you go. Of course, you know, C++ was like C, but better, and Java was like C, but better, but you know. Anyway. <clears throat> so... Where was I? Yes, classes, objects. So we're talking about object-oriented programming, which is a major theme in programming in general. So the idea is that you take a set of data and you take a set of operations and you bundle those operations with the data uh, together. You form a singular unit of them and then you can operate with that uh, that package of operations and data as a singular entity. Um, it is C for people who are taught bad programming practices by Python. Snap! Like I'm doing right now. <clears throat> Oof. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. So, with the... Um, so object oriented sort of if you can if you can wrap your brain around that particular point that you are taking some data and you are taking some op some functions some operations and you're smacking them together and creating a single thing um that is an object in the object oriented sense so <clears throat> you know you're likely to hear a number of jokes about why i'm like terrible like why why i um uh why i hate python's class system so much but um you know we'll try to we'll try to get around that basically i don't like it because it's not like it's not safe it's like i i've been teaching this uh, this third year class so it's like I now have in my possession a more formal definition of what constitutes a safe language than I've ever possessed in my life, if you can believe that. Um, and a safe language is one that protects its own abstractions. 
as, as defined by um, as as defined by Pierce in the Pierce book, which I think is probably one of the classic texts on programming language construction, in my personal opinion. And so what it means to protect your own abstractions is when you do something, it shouldn't be easy for you to violate it, right? And Python classes are extremely easy to violate in terms of the way that they're put together. Uh, so they're not really, like, it's kind of an extension of this idea that Python is like dynamic, like the typing in Python is so loose, it's like, you know, whatever whatever you want it to be, man, that's what it can be, man. It's like the hippie of programming language, which of course makes sense because it's, a, um, you know, named after the P Monty Python. What do I mean by violate? Um, so in Python, you've got this interesting thing. You can create a data field inside of a class from outside of that class. Um, so like one of the things that you often see in object-oriented programming <clears throat> is that classes have a mechanism for protecting their members, right? So it's like you can designate the difference between an internal member and an external member. Uh, that is one that is just stays within the confines of the class itself and one that can be accessed externally. Uh, this is the difference between public and private. Uh, and we're gonna actually going to see how Python, you know, fails to accomplish this with its prop, with its own private constructs a little later on in this uh, in this lecture. But essentially, <clears throat> in Python, if you have a private member, that is to say, if you have like a variable x, which is supposed to be private, if you try to access it, Python pretends it doesn't exist. Uh, but if you like, if you try to get it, it'll pretend it doesn't exist. But if you set it, what Python will actually frickin' do is it will create a new public variable with the same name as the private variable and give you that instead. Which just blows my mind. I don't know why, but um, but that's what I mean by violate. It's like it won't prevent you from like doing terrible things. Not to mention, I've had my auto grader broken twice now, two, con two years running. Someone in this class, in this semester, has broken the frigging auto grader, and it's specifically because Python doesn't protect its own abstractions. It's a little too loose with the polymorphism. That's what I'm, that's what I'm gonna settle on. So anyway, so classes. Uh, one running example we're going to have through the second half of this is, uh, yeah, rip the auto grader. Tell me about it. Um, fortunately, um, I've got more good programmers on the team this year than I had last year. I think I can safely say that. So they're, um, they're coming up with lots of good solutions. <laughs> yeah, um, the, um, the person who broke the auto grader did it much better this time than they did last year. Um, last year, who the 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 guy who uh, uh, the guy who broke the auto grader just friggin' published the exploit publicly on Piazza for everybody and their monkey to read. <laughs> you know, so it's like, damn it! The person who who uh, broke the auto grader this time was. Um, uh, at least, you know, kind enough to let us know privately by email that uh, this exploit existed. Um, did the per did they get in trouble? Uh, no, because it was kind of like, like I talked, I talked to the guy, right? And it wasn't like, like he was actually really apologetic after, um, <laughs> after, after, um, after the incident. He was very apologetic and, um, you know, was contrite of heart, shall we say. So I forgave him. I didn't, like, go after him. Like, it was primarily out of scientific curiosity. Like, scientists, like, a good scientist is kind of, a, like, a very annoying person because they run around with a hammer seeing if they can break things, you know? It's like, hmm, this thing breaks when I hit it with a hammer. 
let me get another one see if that happens again you know that's what a ha that's what a scientist does so why should a computer scientist be any any different also it displays a certain degree of like finesse with the language you know but anyway so um one uh example that we're going to run through several times uh over the course of our discussion of object oriented is the point class so this is a point in Euclidean, <coughs> Euclidean space. Um, uh, can you teach us how to break the auto trader so that we can avoid breaking it? I mean, I hope that was auto correct corrected. Uh, no, I'm not going to show you guys the exploit. If you're, if you want to know the exploit, you're going to have to figure it out yourself. Um, but everything, everything that you need to develop the original exploit that we had to fix last year, you'll actually learn from this lecture. So, uh, <laughs> yep. Anyway, <clears throat> so point in Euclidean space has an X and Y coordinate that are set by the constructor, constructors in Python classes, underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. Uh, the underscore is designated as a magic method, which is to say, like, it's kind of a dumb way of saying it because what you're actually doing is you're just overloading some of Python's inbuilt definitions for various things. We're going to do this with a few different things as we're gonna see. So it's not magic. Magic doesn't exist, but, um, but yeah. So with this data, we also have packaged three, excuse me, uh, three functions which move, scale, and calculate the distance between two point objects. So, methods are called using dot notation. The first parameter, named self by convention, is bound to the object upon which the method is being called. So, um, if we have, uh, I think I've got an example here. So, behave. There we go. So we've got two points here, point A, point B. If we call A dot distance on B, <clears throat> A is self in this case. If I call A dot move with five and six as parameters, A is self. So what self does is it just picks out whatever is before the dot in dot notation. Um, there's actually an alternative way of doing this. Um, if you, you can actually invoke method names directly from the class uh, instance in Python. So point.move a11, one, one, that moves it one, one x and one y. But you can see uh, that under this configuration, a is explicitly mapped to self, which might help you, you know, conceptualize it a little bit better. Um, these, like, if I were to change the arguments here, say, like that, these two ways of phrasing it are precisely and exactly the same, no differences, they are synonyms. Um, for this example, shouldn't we check if other is an instance of point for the distance function? Um, that would be a more safe way of going about it, yes because who the heck knows what you could be getting here, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, no need for static methods. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yes. Every method is basically a static method, but the static variables are a different story. Yes. Um, so, again, I hate Python. 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 So, print A. So what happens if we try to print one of these objects? You know, say we wanted to see the thing and what the contents were. How would we go about that? Uh, the intuitive way of doing that would be to just print the bloody thing. So, Python 3, topic 8, 
app.py. Let's see what our output is. Um, should be the last one here. Hmm. Oh, I need to save it. There we go. We get main dot point object at, and then it gives you the memory address that the object is actually stored at. Which, you know, knowing the memory address of where the object is being stored could help you figure out whether or not the object is being aliased, but probably not what you wanted. You wanted to know what was inside of it. So this is how you do it. You override string conversion using another magic method. Underscore, underscore, string takes self return and then you get to define what string conversion means with respect to this particular thing so i'm gonna say uh, open brace plus string convert self dot x concatenate a comma and space concatenate string convert self dot y plus end brace there we go now if we execute execute you'll see that we get five comma six so if we uh, intersperse a few more of these print statements um, we don't have to print them by the individual. Um, we don't have to pull out individual arguments anymore. We can print everything that we want to see about it all at once. So there you go. You can see we move one, it increases one. We move one, it increases one, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, our class is a way to modularize your program because you could technically solve anything without a class. Yes. So yeah, it's kind of silly to say this because it's like not super true. Like if you're if you're trying to speak practically, but theoretically speaking, and it's be it's interesting how many times theory gets put into practice. Um, you can solve literally any programming problem, literally any programming problem, with if statements and while loops. If statements, while loops, and assignment, and that's all you need to solve literally any program, um, or uh, to write any program. The reason for that, it's kind of technical, is because um, that's sort of the minimal set of constructs which makes a programming language Turing complete. Uh, those of you who are in 1JC3 have probably heard of Turing completeness, uh, but essentially it means that you can construct an equivalent Turing machine from uh, those constructs. Like, any any Turing machine is expressible in terms of those constructs, so literally anything that's calculatable can be calculated by only those constructs, which means you don't technically need classes to do anything, but they're convenient, right? Um... Basically, programs become so complicated that you require better and better processes of abstraction to be able to deal with larger and larger problems. And uh, classes, objects, these are one style of increased abstraction which allows you to solve bigger and better problems um, in reasonable amounts of time. Like, um, there's this one example that I like uh, from my uh, 2MP3 class that I always bring up um, there was a uh, there was an assignment I set once where there's a question right there's a question that like if you had been following the lecture and you used the constructions that I had gone through in lecture that question was like six to eight lines of code right this student comes to me, it's like, I'm having difficulty with this question. I'm like, okay, show me your code. It's like 150 lines of code, mostly correct, right? But they were re-implementing great swathes of the C standard library. And it's like, well, 
yeah, well, no wonder you're having trouble. This is like a six-line solution, but you've got it 150 lines because you're not using the stuff that I've given you. But that's you know, like that's that's the whole thing about programming. Um, using using the abstractions saves you time, saves you energy, saves you brain cells, and is a good strategy on a test. Um, so, like you know. Uh, some of you took a uh, fair amount of time on test one. I, one thing I could recommend to you to reduce the amount of time that you'll spend on test two in the exam is to learn the abstractions. Start using for loops. That's a good start. Anyway, so so what does underscore under, what does the string magic method do? What this is actually doing is it's overloading the definition of Python's inbuilt string conversion operation, which is this guy. So when you convert to string, uh, you're overloading that definition specifically for instances of this class. So implicit, implicit in the uh, in the print method or the print function is string conversion. That's why you can give it like a number and it prints it out as a string, right? it implicitly converts this to a string before outputting it, which makes sense because it's outputting it to a string buffer. So that's why this affects print, right? So yeah, it's string conversion. But we've got all kinds of these things as we're going to see as we get on in the lecture. So there we go. This is an example using the person class from earlier, but it's the same thing. Same idea. So how about equality comparison? By default, equality compares an internal representation, usually the memory address of an object. So when you are comparing two points, right? Let's say, um, boink, boink, there we go. So let's say we had A, B, and C, which we are going to set up an alias of A called C. Print A equals B. Print B equals C. Let's just set everything to the same for the purposes of this. So A and B have the same location. Intuitively, we we would want to say that these are the same point, right? So we would want equality to return true for a comparison of A and B in this case. But what do we get? They're both false because I forgot to compare A and C. There we go. Try it again. There we go. So A and C are the same but A and B are not, and neither are B and C. So essentially, the default behavior of the equality comparison operator over objects is to check to see if they are aliases of each other. Um, however, we can overload equality in the same way that we have overloaded string. Law of transitivity, yes. EQ takes self and other. So what we have to do then is we have to redefine equality in terms of sub-operations, like sub-equalities. Um, our intuitive definition for what should constitute equality over a point object is if the x and the y coordinates are the same, then they're the same point. So we can write that. Return. Um, one condition and another. If self dot x is equal to other dot x and self dot y is equal to other dot y, then we have equality. Now let's see how it works. Syntax error. I should write def instead of dev. There we go. It's all true now. There we go. So we have, so equality now behaves the way that we expect it to. <laughs> yep. 
There we go. Thank you, Mark, for uh, for popping in the chat today and helping me out with this. <clears throat> so. So, you can see we've got string, we've got equality. We actually have a entire list of, like, there is a huge number of these, actually, that you can overload. Let me pull up a list of them. Python. Right. So, here we go. You can overload pretty much all of your um, standard arithmetic operations, including bitwise operations. Um, add, subtract, multiply, floor division, division. We usually call this integer division, but it's also like floor division because it's floor and division at the same time. Um, power, left shift, right shift, and XOR and OR. No, I don't want to talk. Um, assignment operators, unary operators, um, hexadecimal conversion, comparison operators, all kinds of stuff, and a bunch of other things besides. One uh, that's kind of interesting is like if your if your object like contains some kind of data structure type thing going on. You can actually overload iterable, which allows it to be used by for loops, which is kind of cool. Do other programming languages also need you to overload operators? Yeah, actually, this is a very useful thing, right? Um, what we're talking about right now is a concept called polymorphism, which I've mentioned a few times before. Uh, it comes from the Greek, poly meaning many, morphism meaning shape, or morph meaning shape. So, you know, like like the, uh, it's like the polymorph potion in, in the Harry Potter series. So the idea is you have a function, single function name, right? But it has different behaviors depending on what type it's being called on, right? So for example, you know, um, well, string conversion is a is a is a good example, right? String comparison or a string conversion operates differently depending on what you're string converting, right? So it's polymorphic, right? Polyjuice potion. Thank you. Polymorph is like, I don't know, is that a Yu-Gi-Oh thing? I don't know. Anyway. What's the difference between overloading and polymorphism? Uh, overloading is a, is a subset of polymorphism. So polymorphism is like a more general concept than overloading, but overloading, like all instances are of overloading are instances of polymorphism, but not all instances of polymorphism are overloading. Uh, polymerization is a oh, Yu-Gi-Oh. Ah, there we go. So the operator is over, only overridden in that class, but not outside of the class. Well, it's only overridden for instances of that class. When you provide instances of this class, um, then the new definition will apply. But if you haven't overloaded it for this class, then the old definition will apply. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is, it's a Magic the Gathering thing. Well, that's funny, because I've never played Magic the Ga Gathering. But uh, anyway. <clears throat> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yes, thank you, it's not my birthday. <laughs> so. So, anyway. So you can overload methods. So let's, so, and now for something completely different, let's talk about inheritance. So, inheritance is a little bit, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, you got me. Um, 
So inheritance, right? Inheritance is very, like... It's like when your uncle dies and leaves you all his stuff. That's what, uh... That's kind of like what inheritance is. Um... In a, uh... In, in programming, a little bit. Like... What we do... So, okay. Let me start by explaining what problem this is trying to solve, right? So, when you're writing these these objects, it may be that you want to organize your objects into a kind of hierarchy based on specificity, right? So, let's imagine for a moment, let's use our brains, let's imagine that we had a cat class, right? So, a cat, the cat class would contain some fields such as, you know, color, what color is the cat, um, size, how, how big is the cat, um, position in three-dimensional space, position in time, you know, all of the things that could characterize a cat. These would be attributes of the cat class, right? However, to say cat is not to say anything very specific. There are many different types of cats in the world. Are we talking about a big cat, like a lion, like a zoologically defined big cat, like a lion or a leopard or a tiger or something? Are we talking about a medium-sized but wild cat, such as a bobcat or a lynx? Or are we talking about the common house cat, right? This is what you would do. You would define cat as a very general thing that contains all of the things that each type of cat can have, and then you would define subclasses, or in this case, we would call them derived classes, right? So, for example, um, let's big let's let's make a uh, let's make a class for big cats big cats according to the zoological def definition, which includes lions and tigers, right? So, if we were to define a class for big cats, we would give it some attributes that don't belong to the base class. Like, for example, the ability to roar belongs to big cats, not to any other type of cat, right? Um, you could say... Um, you could like you could restrict the uh, styles of coloration of the base class of cat to those specifically applicable to big cats. Um, you could you know say something about like I'm thinking specifically about lions, so let's just talk about lions. You know you could say something about like the f the familial structure that's followed by lions that could be embedded inside of the information in the class, but it would still inherit from the cat class, right? So now we've got lions defined. Let's talk about house cats, right? Um, you would give a house cat various other attributes, you know, either either data or actions, right? Uh, house cats, you would give it a puke inside of your shoes men method, you know, or on the carpet. You would you would give that a, it a me you would give house cats a method like that, you would give house cats a method of like uh, a, a method for like climbing on top of your keyboard and like go, going back flat on it and expecting you to rub its belly. That's something that a house cat that only house cats do, so it goes in the house cat class. But it still inherits from cat, right? So everything a cat is, a house cat is also, right? Everything a cat is, a lion is out also. But by setting up two different classes that inherit from the base class, which is cat, uh, these two derived classes are allowed to differentiate their, their abilities. So, generally, the relationship between a derived class and a base class is the derived class is some more specific version of the base class. So, so let's talk about extending our definition of Euclidean points. Let us introduce the concept of color. 
Um, let's say we were doing some kind of graphing application and we wanted the graph markers to be, you know, red, blue, green, yellow, etc. All of your sort of regular colors. Um, everything but white, because white the background is presumably white, unless it's one of those ones where the background doesn't have to be white, in which case white is a valid color marker. Anyway, so all we basically want to do is add one more attribute to the class, right? We want now to be able to record what color the uh, what color the point is. So the way we do this is we say class colored point inherits from point. So by saying that it inherits from point, we are including everything in the definition of point inside of this, right? So po colored point now has everything that point has. So we can actually update colored point by updating point, right? Um, there's this very, very useful sort of heuristic in software development only say it once, right? If you've got code that's copy-pasted several times throughout your program, if you need to change it, you need to remember all of the places that you put that code um, in order to, um, in order to, you know, affect the change. Whereas, if there's only ever one place that it's ever defined, and everything else is a reference to that place, you can fix all of it just by fixing that one instance of it, which makes your code much more maintainable, much more maintainable. Uh, and maintenance is a, um, is a very substantial factor, right? Because like um, with a lot of software projects, the maintenance costs exceed the initial, initial development cost. Anyway, <clears throat> so, Yes. So we have to write a constructor. Def init takes self x not y not and color and puts that and um, drops that in self dot x. This is like compound assignment again self dot y is equal to x not comma y not uh, instant I'll show you an interesting trick with this and self dot color is equal to uh, it should be Canadian not American spelling geez color there we go and if we want to add something to do with this color incidentally we're assuming color is being stored as a string here not as like RGB values um, def darken self self dot color is equal to dark and then self dot color. So all that's all that um, the oh another reason I hate Python. If I had forgotten to include the u there, like I almost did this method would have just created another variable misspelled inside of the class. Um, good lord, I hate Python. So anyway, <clears throat> so let's say we instantiate a new point. We all shall make it a colored point. And we will give it the coordinates two, three, and the color um, red, not read, red d dot darken and print d dot color you can see that the color now reads as dark red but because we have inherited from the point class we have all of the other things that are defined in point available to us as well so for example the definition of how the thing prints out is being used from the point class. Yeah. HSV is better than RGB. Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. 
strongly, strongly agree. Um, although that is a, a somewhat tangential point. Good. So. <clears throat> yeah. So, with, um, so, sometimes when you're, uh, when you're setting up an inheritance scheme, you want certain, um, you want to re-overload some of, like, you want to overload methods, right? So, this is another instance of polymorphism. So, in the, in the original, so if you notice, right now, we're making reference to the original definition of string conversion existing in the point class, right? What, but that might not jive with our current conception of what a colored point should look like as we print it, right? So, <clears throat> in theory, we would want, like, it's possible that we would want the, um, the color to be indicated somehow inside of this new string conversion function, or inside of the old one. So what we would do is we would overload the definition of string conversion in the point class by redefining it, right? Let's say we wanted to return the point definition of string as applied to self. And then we would concatenate that with, say, a colon, and then string convert um, self dot color. So if we run that, we now get both pieces of information. We get the coordinates in, in there, and we get the color in there. Now, I'm doing an interesting thing here. I'm actually using the old definition of string conversion from the point class inside of the new one that I'm overloading. The way that you get at them is by making reference to the method through the class name itself. Now you can't do this, um, you can't do this just with self, right? Because self in this case is, um, you know, if you, if you invoked string conversion over self inside of the definition of string conversion, you would, end, you would find yourself in possibly infinite recursion territory, uh, which obviously you don't want to do. So if you make reference to the sort of inner definition of string conversion, uh, what you're essentially doing by, uh, what you're essentially doing by calling this earlier version of string conversion with self as a parameter is you're saying to Python, okay, for the purposes of this, just treat this as if it's not the thing I said it is, but it's the, you know, it's the base class. Treat this as an instance of the base class, and there you go. Uh, so that's how that works, in Python at least. Good. And obviously you can do that with as many methods as you want. Uh, that's also done by default with the constructor. So there you go. <clears throat> so, classification. This is kind of a really, there, there we go. So, classification. So why, why, like, who, who thought of this and why? Inheritance in programming languages originates with classifications of objects in the world, the physical world, uh, for example, in biology. Inheritance can go over several levels. Inheritance was used first in Simula 67 for simulation programs where real objects of the real world were represented by objects in the program. Later on in uh, Smalltalk 80, inheritance was used for general programming. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of interesting to note that the manner in which object-oriented programming inherits things also like that's roughly equivalent to the manner in which the human brain 
classifies objects in sort of, um, you know, in meat space. So, generally speaking, like, say for example, you're thinking about a teapot, right? You don't think this is a, you know, this is a teapot that is has a mass of exactly 157 grams. It has a lid that is composed of this precise and exact shape. It is composed particularly of terracotta with a brown glaze. It is, you know, you don't examine every stitch in the tea cozy, right? You will say to yourself, this is a teapot. You grab the handle, and after you have filled it with hot water and tea bags, tea comes out. You know, it's like input, output. This is an input-output device, at least with respect to your brain. So what your brain can do is it can abstract away all of those nasty little details so that you don't have to think to use a teapot. This is precisely the sort of thing that we're going with, going for with, um, with, uh, with programming. Who's Phil the platypus? I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, uh, so that's my time for today. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, if not, I'm gonna, I have another class to get to today, so I'll, uh, I'll have to keep it short. But, any questions? Missed opportunity to put Perry the platypus in class. Yes, um, I um, I don't think that Doctor Stabila was like young and hip enough to uh, to to know about Phineas and Ferb. At some point, when I get enough time to be able to uh, reshape these slides in my own image, I'll probably uh, put some more interesting stuff on this. Okay, well, <clears throat> if there's nothing further, I'm going to get the heck out of here. I didn't know I was a dentist. Ah! Yes. Um... All dentists are named Kenneth, but not all Kenneths are named dentist. Or not all not all people named Kenneth are dentists. Um. <laughs> it's like that Monty Python sketch with um, the uh, the philosophers the the the, uh, the philosophers faculty in in Australia the Australian philosophers sketch. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go look it up. It's hilarious. Anyway, I'm getting out of here. Take her easy, folks. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.